This week's episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Eric Wilson uh, from back when we had an audio podcast and had Patreons and stuff. So thanks so much, Eric. Sorry for the late uh, late acknowledgement, but hope you enjoy the episode. So I'm joined by Charlie Bosco for the last three and a half years, I guess. You've been the face and voice of climbing at the IFSC, and you're joining me from uh, from Innsbruck right now, right? Yeah, from Innsbruck, going up to Munich on the train on Thursday night for what's probably our biggest event of the year, uh, viewing figures-wise. It must be nice. I And I mean, it's a place you've lived in, presumably for most of your life, just being in Europe where you can get to everything fairly easily. But over here in North America, I feel often extremely disconnected from the climbing universe. So I'm envious of your itinerary where it's just back and forth by train rather than these huge transatlantic flights. Oh, no, don't worry. I, I got a, I had a nightmare journey back from China, if that makes you feel Oh, better. really? What happened on the way back? Um, do you remember in Moscow, the um, that plane caught fire? No. Uh, last week? Yeah, it caught fire. Uh, oh, landing. the, the Sukhov. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, yeah, I remember this so on the news. It, it didn't have any climbers on it, though, right? No, but we were transiting there. And there was me oh, no. and Eddie and had Alexei Rubsov and Adam Ondra all on the same flight. Uh, and we, we got out of Shanghai on time. But when we got to Moscow, they said no more flights. So uh, I had a bonus night in Moscow airport. So oh, that's terrible. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, so it's a first world problem, but. Yeah. Sure, you. Sure, when, yeah, it's, yeah. Not all, it's not all like the sound of music through Switzerland on trains. That's all I'm saying. I've, I've only been through Switzerland twice, and the entire time it was the sound of music while I was okay. there. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm you not. You keep that image in your head. Yeah, I'm not totally just, jaded. Uh, yet. Just block out the bonus night in Moscow. Show yeah, that there you go. Um, so when I originally intended to speak to you, um, I'm very interested in how climbing is broadcast and how sports are presented to an audience. And of course, as somebody in the climbing industry myself, I, I wanted to kind of pick your brain on that side of things. But uh, a lot of my context and the questions I have about climbing and sports are rooted in my own personal history with athletics and how I view the spectator experience. And I don't have much of that context about yourself. And so over time, just figuring out what I wanted to talk to you, I realized I had a fairly long list of biographical stuff that I wanted to check in with you about and learn more about yourself before we even get to talking about climbing today and uh, and how it might develop. So I apologize in advance if this turns to be more of like a life story episode than, uh, than like a deep, deep climbing one. But the place I wanted to start with yourself was um, you are a climber, but you are a kind of an all around sportsman yourself. Um, just from your Instagram, I've seen climbing and a lot of backcountry skiing and, of course, hiking. And it sounds like kayaking and skydiving, things like that. You are, are certainly somebody that appreciates the outdoors and are an athlete in your own uh, in your own way. Um, and that's not something I experienced when I was young. So I wanted to know a bit more about how you developed your athletic side or at least your um, your sense of sport and yourself. If it was just kind of an English desire to ramble or whatever it is you guys do over there how did you develop that side of yourself well firstly i've never been called an athlete or an all-around sports person <laughs> so you've, you've already won me over you can have as, as long as you want there you go see that. yeah um so i was super well for a start i was never uh, sporty as a kid when i was 13 i was the smallest kid in my year at high school uh just had nothing about me physically like to the point, I think my parents were quite worried. I was so kind of weedy. They were kind of worried with how about how I'd cope with the, the rough and tumble of, of life. And then uh, the school I went to, I was, I was super lucky. I went to a school in the northwest of England. And um, they had a really strong outdoors scene. Not with any, any focus. It wasn't like a climbing school or, or anything. But just a school with a really big focus on getting kids outdoors. And we just had some amazing opportunities. And um, I got to go on trips in the Lake District and then abroad and they ran ski trips. And uh, I was fortunate enough that my parents were able to send me on these trips and we just kind of got to experience the outdoors. But it's it's weird in your teens. It, I don't know. I mean, it's a, probably a bit different for Yanya Garnbrett. It certainly seems okay. to have been a bit different for Yanya. But in my teens, you're so busy drinking and trying to discover what women are that um the outdoors was kind of something i did on school trips and then i'd come back and forget it and go back to trying to get served beer when we were underage and <laughs> um and then um 
so it just stayed as something I did on on trips and again there was no particular focus on climbing I just liked I just liked the adventure of it I liked being outside I liked the challenge I kind of realized that I was mate I was just tougher than most people um which and that was and then I started to develop a bit of confidence around that so I went from this really weedy kid to being a aesthetically still pretty weedy but I kind of knew that I, I had a bit of steel in me uh and then yeah so throughout my teens I just went on school trips and got all these big opportunities and I went uh, to New Zealand for a year and I taught in a school I didn't really do anything climbing or outdoorsy there had a really um hedonistic year <laughs> and then um went to university and then over the course of university just fell in with uh, with climbers and when I left university, I um, I started working at an outdoor centre near where I grew up, uh, and it's it's weird looking back now. And I was actually I've just got back from a weekend in the in the city I went to university in. It's the first time I've been since I graduated in two thousand and six. And when I left, there was I just never uh, considered that I would get a real job, hmm. which seems ridiculous now. If I met a twenty two year old who just said. Yeah, yeah, no, no plans really. I would just, I don't know. It, it just seems so ridiculous. But I never, it never occurred to me to get a real job. Uh, and I just fell in with these climbers, and really, from from liking the outdoors in general and liking sports in general, really focused on climbing. I, I went down a few avenues. I tried kayaking. Uh, spent a couple of years doing all my skydiving licenses, but nothing, nothing kind of gripped me the same way. And then from there. Yeah, that was it. I'd found my thing. Was there a, a, a change where you, so you you went to university? You traveled fairly far to go to university. Was there? Well, it was a two and a half hours drive away, which in England is a long way. In this, in in North America, it's... oh, I misunderstood then some of your biographical info. Anyway, so you, when you went, no, to sorry, uni- I, I went to New Zealand for a year just uh, to teach in a school just for a year out. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, did you have coming out of high school? Although it sounds like you were maybe a little bit lost in high school as well. Did you have any in, uh, any interest or intent of of what a career might look for you, or or were you fairly no. lost when you went into university? Yeah, no, I had no idea. I was going to join the army actually. Okay. Um, and I back in the de- back in those days, it was so good. They had a university regiment, uh, at, and you got paid to go. So when you're a student, you can either make whatever five pounds an hour behind a bar we were getting paid 80 pounds a day wow to to do military training i just thought this is amazing that's a pretty Um, good offer yeah it was great so i did that and i thought i'd join the military and then i kind of realized that wasn't for me after a while um i played rugby at university rugby union um and would like to have done that but being five foot nine like 170 centimeters about (laughs) 65 kgs yeah uh, not very quick, not especially skillful, not that intelligent uh, in terms of rugby. It wasn't adding up to to a career. But no, so I had no idea. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Wow. Then the the other question I have to ask, uh, because it seems like it started young, was your interest in writing uh, and that you've been writing to some degree in different ways for a fairly long time. Um, and I think in the last while probably a lot of it has been focused on climbing specifically, but you've done a bunch of writing for, for frankly, different sports. And in other ways, your interest in other sports has developed. So it sounds like in high school, you're introduced to the outdoors. Uh, but at some point, you also developed an interest in um, in just other forms of competitive sport. Uh, was your interest in writing developed um, alongside that as somebody that wanted to do sports writing? Or was that a separate uh, interest that came along through school um again at the school i went to with this really strong focus on on the outdoors we did a, a trip in in scotland and there's a a way you can canoe across scotland it takes five days and you go through um they call them locks lakes basically and mm-hmm. canals and uh, when i got back school said oh would, would you write it up would you write something about it i was only 14 um and i did it and really liked it and again, it's one of those things that are kind of, you know, it's funny now. I've never thought about this. Now you've asked me. I don't know what I did in my late teens. <laughs> I, I wasn't writing. I wasn't doing stuff in the outdoors. Uh, yeah, there seems to be this big blank period between like, getting really keen at about 14 and then getting really keen at 20 again. Um, no, so it developed through that. 
and it's one of those things I've always done. I wrote at uh, the school had a, a magazine, and every time I did an outdoor trip, I'd, I'd write something for it. Uh, and then I did my degree was in politics, so um, inevitably you just you have to be able to write to an to an okay standard. Sure. Um, and then as I moved to the Alps and got more into climbing and skiing, it was it was um, a way of earning money. Right. And I also wrote I had a blog for a long time. So again, it's one of those things that's grown organically. I just realized that I have a, I can produce an okay turn of phrase. There's definitely uh, big limitations on my writing, but if I'm writing about something I'm enthusiastic about and it's, um, I don't want to say jokey, but kind of informal writing, mm-hmm. then I'm quite good at it. But uh, kind of academic, like real writing, I'd be terrible at. I couldn't write for a newspaper, but if it's trip report, semi amusing, blog type then then yeah i just seem to have a, a good turn of phrase and i like doing it i love it when you write a sentence and you go oh that's good i like that <laughs> yeah um so you're writing for for other websites uh between this writing you did for school and then having a blog for yourself um you said that writing was a good way to make money when you were outside how did these connections develop with places like i think like a uh, ukc um i guess you did some stuff for the bmc at some point i'm not sure what that was um but uh, how did those develop were you reaching out to them or were you developing a reputation as a bit of a as an outdoor writer yourself well it went both ways actually and um there's a good lesson in this, and I always try and remember it. And whenever people ask my advice, my advice is always, look, it, it doesn't really matter what you do. Just start doing something. Because mm-hmm. I got to, basically, I finished university. I worked in an outdoor center for a year. Still had no idea what I wanted to do. Guessed I'd be a kind of outdoors instructor. And then I got op- offered um, some trekking work, leading people around Mont Blanc. This is before the days when you really needed to be qualified to take treks. We're not talking about taking them to the summit of Mont Blanc. It's sure. Paths. It's trails, marked trails, hiking trails, and um, ended up going to Chamonix and, and just stayed. And mm-hmm. I, I started writing after after I'd been there a while. I started writing a blog, and there was no reason to start writing a blog. I just felt like no one did, and I never knew what conditions were like. So I should be the person who wrote the blog. And um, I mean, initially it was named after Borat. You remember the the, <laughs> the film? It was called. Um, it was called Blog for Make Benefit of Chamonix Climate. <laughs> it was just a joke. And I just uh, And then people started reading it. And I thought, oh wow, this is this is kind of a thing. Um and so I just kept writing, kept writing, kept writing. And then that led to uh, the guy from UK Climbing, you know Jack Geldard? No. Right. He, no, he I'm ran... very disconnected from the scene right. over there, yeah. So Jack was chief editor of UK Climbing for a decade, really in the decade when it went from a little website to what it is now mm-hmm. did a really good job of it um he emailed me and said oh, i'm moving to chamonix we should climb together so then i knew jack and then he introduced me to his boss alan james at uk ukc uh i got a few bits published started testing kit for them published kit reviews um and then then you've got a bit of a reputation it becomes easier to email the bmc four line skiing powder magazine because you're not just some guy you you have evidence of what you've done before, uh, but it all actually it all stemmed back to to me writing a blog about Chamonix, and that's why whenever people say oh, I want to be X, a rock star, mm-hmm. a climbing commentator, whatever, I always just say to them, just do something, mm-hmm. because if I hadn't started that blog, I wouldn't have met Jack. I probably wouldn't have done any writing. If I hadn't met Jack and done any writing. I wouldn't have ended up at Epic TV, which means I wouldn't have ended up at the IFSC, which means, who knows? I mean, maybe I'd start, would have started a hedge fund and be a billionaire <laughs> now. But um, yeah, just it all started with me writing that blog. So as I say, my advice is always just 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 do something. Be proactive. If you want to, you want to be a writer, just start writing. Put it out there. Write Instagram captions. If you want to be a presenter, walk around with your iPhone and practice presenting and watch it back. You know, just, just do something because that's... It all stemmed from me writing that blog, and nothing, nothing prompted me to start it. So, hmm. yeah, glad I started it. You've also got interest just in other sports. You mentioned that you wanted to play some rugby union. I couldn't tell the difference between rugby union and rugby league if I had to. I just know there's two of them, and apparently you, it's a pretty you impassioned need, fight. It's but... a thinking man's game. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, we uh, in Toronto here. We just got, I, and I don't know which is which, but we've had. Uh, 
uh, we had a rugby team for a while and then we recently got uh, an, another rugby team of the other uh, persuasion uh, and I can't remember which is which but anyway it's our already this is, our, it, honestly this is like listening to my wife talk about rugby just move on okay we'll uh, we'll skip this entirely <laughs> but but aside aside from well apparently our Toronto team is wrecking everybody in whatever league they're, oh, really? uh, they're, okay. uh, Toronto right. Wolfpack I don't know apparently it's a fairly I guess it's the smaller of the two rugby disciplines and uh, and all of our big Toronto money is just buying up all the all the great players but anyway you it you've kind of described yourself as being a bit of a fan of that and it looks like you've dabbled as a spectator as a writer for other competitive sports um, where did that come from do you have kind of a family history of, of watching sports and it just grew out of that or did, did you have like kind of a separate passion in uh, in those competitive games again when I was in my teens it just wasn't interested I, I liked what we call football soccer mm -hmm. um, back in the day but kind of lost interest in that as well and then when I went to teach in New Zealand for that year out you've just got to like rugby <laughs> or you'll have nothing to talk about and there'll be nothing to watch on TV and so I kind of reluctantly started to watch it uh, and just got really into it and yeah I've, I've just always watched a lot of sport um, there's rugby union and the Formula One racing I would say are the two things I watch I really follow um, but I was never in danger of making it in any sport so I, I've always just been a pure spectator but yeah r rugby and, and Formula One remain my big two sporting passions outside climbing. All right. So you have a, a podcast and I think this is actually, we're kind of like skipping over a few years to get to the the podcast that you run called The Winning Mentality. And that is an interesting title uh, for me because it, uh, it, it su suggests that you've probably done some um, more advanced thinking on how winners or how great athletes perform and function uh, as opposed to everybody else. Um, so you weren't an athlete yourself. It sounds like you didn't do much competitive or any competitive sport on your own. Um, and this is something I can somewhat relate to. So I kind of want to see how you developed in this way. Um, but how was your appreciation for great athletes changed over time? Because I know for sure that I had no appreciation for that when I was young. And then as I became a climber and then as I started watching whatever sports that I now enjoy watching, it's taken me through a bunch of years of trying to justify my interest in a sport that I previously thought held no value. Uh, so how is, how has that journey gone for yourself of just trying to figure out how to appreciate uh, sport and, uh, and exemplary athletics? Well, yeah, I suppose a bit like you, when you're young, you just, you just worship the best player on the team and you think is amazing. And then as of, watch sport more and i've been quite lucky i've got friends who are, who are quite into it you begin to appreciate the nuances more mm -hmm. and i should say this is all purely a hobby none of this is um in any way a job or anything it's purely my, my passion and hobby but um i suppose you just start looking for depth in something um i think yeah, it's, it's the nuance, it's the subtlety. And uh, and also you don't know where your interest will take you. And I watched sports, uh, particularly in the last five years. I mean, when I was in Chamonix, it was just kind of climb, climb, climb. But particularly in the last five years, uh, watching more sports, I've just for, for, I don't, for indefinable reasons, become very interested in the psychological uh, elements of sport. And a bit like I said earlier about the blog, if you're going to do something, if or if you want to do something, just just start doing it. Mm -hmm. I just thought, well, this really interests me. I can't see a career for me in it, but there may be a career in it, or there may be an addition to my existing career in it. So just follow the interest and see where it goes. And uh, yeah, it's just led me to start my podcast, and it's it's basically an excuse to talk to interesting people. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it's. It's theoretically an analysis of the of the psychological element of sport because that's what interests me so much. Um, it sometimes wavers and just becomes let's talk to an interesting person sure. about something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can't really put my finger on it. It just to me, sport isn't very interesting if you take the, the psychological element of it out. Um, mm. But one thing I would say that I've come to appreciate over time is if, if you look at anything, it's interesting. I found when I was guiding for a few years. Um, you'd have a client who didn't seem very interesting. But if you just keep going, they'll have some in. And 
they might tell you they work as a bank clerk nothing mm-hmm. against bank clerks it does but it's not something that you instantly think oh, that's got to be the most fascinating thing in the world <laughs> but you get talking to them and and there's something interesting there and i've found that with sports if you just watch it from a purely visual point of view it quickly gets boring and so now, uh, although I said rugby and Formula One are the two sports I watch most, if I've got a guest coming up who's in any sport, I can I can find interest in it. And I can, and it's um, I've kind of got to the stage now where I can see why anyone is interested in anything. <laughs> There's nothing where I just think that's horrendous. Why would you ever watch that? You've only spoken, if I remember right, on your podcast to one or two climbers. Uh, the rest of them yeah. have been from across other sports or and not necessarily athletes, but people just involved in um, the kind of the psychology of athletics, as you mentioned. Um, that said, you've spent a lot of time around climbers and speaking to climbers and interviewing them. Uh, do you sense any kind of Aside from there's there's obviously a kind of breed of champions. Uh, they just have a different way of looking at the world and looking at themselves. But from climbers to other sports, are you noticing differences in personality uh, or differences in how they think about their pursuit? I would say climbing has um, a marathon to run before it's on on the same level as other sports uh, in terms of mentality. Climbing climbing is currently on the earth and other sports are on the moon. I mean, there is so far to go. Uh, do you, do you I, mean that in the sense that climbers themselves see themselves uh, in a, sorry, do you think that climbers themselves are underdeveloped in terms of yeah, their yeah. athletic uh, perspective? How so? Uh, maybe, maybe not their athletic perspective. So I've been in, I've been interviewing, I've been really lucky. It's amazing who'll say yes to a podcast if you just ask him. <laughs> no um, I, I've interviewed the guy who's the, um, who is the head psychologist for the England soccer team, which obviously in England, that's the, it's the only show in town is the, the, fo- the football, the soccer team. Sure. Uh, yesterday, the day before, I interviewed a guy called Steve Black, who was mentor to Johnny Wilkinson, who's probably the most famous rugby player. He was the most famous player in the world for a while, certainly the most famous player England's ever produced. I talked to a guy who's been very high up in rugby league, and the same themes keep appearing um, of how winners function, how they think, and I don't see many of the climbers currently exhibiting those behaviours. Um, and that's not a criticism of them. It, the England soccer team will have a budget. You can't imagine what the budget must be. I don't know what the budget must be. But it would be tens, if not hundreds of millions a year. So they can afford to have him. They can afford to have the players studied in a way that, that uh, climbers can't. But yeah, the, there's a huge leap. To, there's a huge leap to be made in all sports. That's one thing... Uh, even top psychiatrists will say, is, uh, psychologists will say, there is a huge gain to be made in everyone's mind. But climbers, I feel, are, are a long way off even parity with with most athletes. Do you think that? So, if if we had the the resources to to give climbers uh, more psychological training, I'm sure we could make developments there. But do you think that some of that is just the nature of the sport, and that let's say a lot of them? don't necessarily see it as a long-term career because there are so few opportunities from it? Or do you feel it might be because there's not enough just mentors or or um, people still in the scene from back in the day to provide that guidance and share the lessons they learned? Is it where, I just where do you I see? I mean, I just don't think we have, and this is a no slight on any coach at all, because mm-hmm. there's some very good coaching and climbing, but we don't have people of the caliber of Bill Bessick, who is the soccer guy mm-hmm. or steve black who i interviewed on sunday these are literally the world's best um and climbing just doesn't have access to people like that and part of it is resources uh, and part of it is the fact that really it's a young sport uh and it's changing at such a rate that that element of it hasn't caught up yet the the psychological element i mean if you if you think about what the mind can do so the thing of Tom Brady is the most successful quarterback in the history of American football and is still physically the worst quarterback tested in the history of the NFL draft. He's the slowest. He's got the shortest vertical jump. He's by every measure. He's the worst quarterback that's ever been tested in the NFL draft. And he is the most successful quarterback in the history of the NFL. So there's only one reason why that is. And it's his mind. And if you watch him play, you can see that he's thinking everything's happening in slow motion for him. 
everybody else is rushing and it's like he's watching it on 0.5 speed and it's his mind it's his, his the power of his mind and uh, when you talk to top psychologists they'll tell you there is, we're, we're so far from optimizing mental performance even someone like Brady has has a huge way to go uh, and these people that are saying this are working with top athletes and working with them day in day out and yet you've got climbers who chances are most of them have never spoken to a psychologist so they haven't even started the process and the guys at the sharp end of the spear at the tip of the spear the world's best psychologist even they are saying oh even at my level we've got miles to go and I feel like um, climbing as a sport or climbers as athletes would benefit massively from psychological improvement. I mean, you're, when you, if anybody who watches the live stream can tell when a climber is not in the mood, mm -hmm. you can see it, right? We, I don't want to name names, but <laughs> we've seen it in Boulder finals already in 2019. People sure. have come out and I'm looking for the words. And what I mean is they don't look in the mood. Yeah. But I can't really say that on the live stream, so I have to say, oh, it looks focused, or they look <laughs> distracted. What you mean is, sure. I think this will be a car crash, because you don't look in the mood. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if someone could overcome that, then they dominate. I mean, if Yanya could, if Yanya wanted, was really in the mood every World Cup, I, I don't really see how anyone would ever beat her. <laughs> uh, if, she, if she could tap into that, and access the correct mind state for every World Cup. I don't, I, it's nothing against her rivals, but I, I don't really see how how anybody could could take her on. I'm not going to put you on the spot to call anybody out that might be lacking in that department. But let's no, talk I, about I don't think anybody. I don't think anybody is specifically lacking it. I think well, everybody everybody in the world uh, lacks psychological tools. And, sure. And, and and in sports, that's that's definitely true. But what I'm saying is in climbing, sometimes it's so blatant, you can see it. So um, let me let me go with the, the opposite end then. Are there any climbers that you, and not to this kind of Tom Brady level necessarily, where they're just so exemplary that it's, uh, that it's like a, a talking point, but are there any climbers you admire for always having the right head game or people that you feel might be uh, kind of one level above most of the, uh, the crowd? Um, I think Jakob Schubert stands out for me. I don't really. I mean, he doesn't always get the results he wants. He's missed a couple of semi-finals this year. He's only made one one final, I think, mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Um, but he's a competitor, and he's never there to make up the numbers. He's there to win, and I think that is is really impressive. Akio Noguchi at times I feel has that like that serenity. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember kind of in last year, maybe the year before, one of one of the years we've been in Japan. Um, she looked shaken by by the crowd. Hmm. Um, Shauna Coxie at times does seem to have accessed it, where she's come out under massive pressure and, and managed to deliver. Um, and Yanya, when Yanya's in the mood psychologically, she's uh, the strongest of all. But hopefully we can geek out about Yanya a bit later on. Sure. Um, but... Uh, no, nobody stands out where I think, yeah, you, you've you've really got it every week. Uh, but if I had to name someone, I'd, I'd probably say Jakob's the best, the best competitor. Interesting. And and I think uh, climbing as well um, still needs to slightly get over this kind of. I don't want to say I don't want to say anything unpleasant, but they need to get over this. Oh, we're super friendly. I don't care if I don't win as long as my friend gets to win, because you don't really see that in other sports. So that's an example of what I'm talking about uh, when I talk about the psychological developments that still await in climbing. I'm so glad to hear you say that. That that's that's a, but, a well, great sign. I, I don't. I don't. Um, if you watch Formula One, mm -hmm. they, they will say, "I was beaten today." Sure. But they do not look happy doing no. that. <laughs> they are furious that yeah. they lost. And it yeah. could be an internal fury. It's not. I'm not saying that climbers have to hate each other. You can be best friends, and there are lots of examples of people in high-level sports who are literally best friends with people they compete against. But you cross the white line, or you put the helmet on, or you put you, you go out in the Boulder final. Uh, the the greats want to tear the other people's legs off, mm -hmm. and um, I think there are still few climbers, not many climbers, who have that.
And I think that that would already be uh, a big gain if we could encourage that competitiveness. It sounds like this is something you agree with. Yeah, I I I think there's a lot of room for just a, in terms of a spectator experience. I've kind of voiced this already that I think there's room for a little bit more color in terms of uh, how the competitors interact among other things. Um, but I I and my most of my experience with climbers is obviously at a different level uh, than than a lot of uh, what you have. So I'm I for the most part was a, a youth coach for a long time for recreational and competitive, and then I spent a lot of time kind of hovering around the periphery of of high level Canadian climbers at World Cups and things like that. So obviously a, a different level than the people you're talking about. But and the and this is an, a half formed thought, but climbing. Uh, even as a recreational pursuit involves so much uh, failure. Um, and whether you're in the climbing gym or on the stage of a finals, it often involves an audience. And I think I've noticed, and certainly within myself as well, that um, there are, as much as we can all say we we all love bouldering and we're okay with the idea of failing, we all often have a, a sort of defense mechanism against how we uh, present those failures that we have and how we cope with those and how we um, kind of shake them off when we have mm. to do that in front of other people. And I f have found with some particular athletes that uh, that when they compete, there's almost um, rather than striving to win, they are trying to make sure their failures don't don't look too bad. I feel like I'm not articulating that very well, but that uh, um, they're trying to kind of mollify the lower end of their performance rather than fighting for the higher end, I guess, is, is the, the best way I can describe that. I don't know if you feel like you see that at the high level as well. I feel like hopefully not. Um, I don't see that that much uh, but because I just think at the IFSC, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of conscious it sounded like I'm giving climbers a hard time. It's not that at all. It's just we're, we're, we're almost at the, if you think the Olympics only got announced three years ago, we're almost mm -hmm. at the start of this type of competitive climbing mm -hmm. journey and i'm just saying there's a long way to go mm -hmm. uh, i wouldn't say i've seen that because uh, they wouldn't have got to the ifsc if you if you That's think fair. how many people are competing they wouldn't have got that far uh, without a, a psychological flaw that big um so that's not something i see but Everyone, I've, all the psychologists I've spoken to, and I've not spoken to that many, I don't know, half a dozen, but I've had an hour with them, uh, not analyzing me, I should add. Um, <laughs> that would be a whole separate podcast. You yeah, should consider exactly. it. I don't think there's much to analyze, to be honest. Okay. Pretty basic. Um, they say the Irish are the only people who are impervious to psychological <laughs> analysis, don't they? I'm English, so, you know, pretty close. Um, but there, there are, I would say there are definitely... Uh, recurring psychological flaws and i mean well have we got time to try something out we do all right okay uh so I, i've talking to a, spoken to a couple of psychologists and they were saying look there's a simple game you, simple games you can play with your head and just to illustrate the power of the mind so a guy said all right i'm i'm, I'm, I'm looking at my webcam but i'm going to trust you that you close your eyes all right you've got to close right. your eyes okay you got to close your eyes okay you, you're about to play golf you're stepping up to the first tee and I say to you, right, when you hit this shot, it doesn't matter where it goes, but don't go left, okay? Because if you go left, you go in the rough, you'll be a couple of shots behind before you even get your round underway. If you go left, the weekend is over. Just just forget it, okay? Don't go left. When you walk up to the tee, what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about not going left, man. You're thinking about not going left. <laughs> so you're not thinking about how you hit the ball. You're not thinking... What's my stance? What am I aiming to do here? You're just thinking, oh my God, don't go left. Sure. And he was saying, now just imagine you walk up to the ball and your coach puts his arm on your shoulder and says, hey, you've hit this shot, shot 10,000 times. Get your stance right. Get your swing right. Don't think about anything. It'll take care of itself. Go straight down the middle if you can. Ideally right. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You, you might Instantly you're thinking, everything's calm. I'm going to hit it down the middle. If it goes a bit right, that's fine. And this, it's a super basic example, but you can, if, if people do that, they can instantly picture in their head, in example one, you walk up to the ball, nervous with a negative outcome in your head. I don't want to go left. 
if someone puts their arm on your shoulder and says the right thing at the right time, you just go through a process you've gone through a hundred thousand times before and you, you knock it straight down the middle. And it's just a, an, an easy example that he gave me of the power of the mind. Now, there's an awful lot that goes into achieving hitting it down the middle. Mm -hmm. But a 10 second briefing before you go up to that first tee or that first boulder problem could fundamentally shift your whole thinking. So if you're about to go out to the boulder in the first boulder in Munich and uh, someone says, you're really bad at slabs and this is a slab. <laughs> your mindset is completely different to if you go out and go, I, I think I figured that out in observation. Mm -hmm. I think I know how to do this. And someone just has the right word for you at the right time. So it's, yeah, again, I'm not putting myself forward as an expert. I'm just saying you can see there are huge, huge gains that can be made in mindset. And everybody knows from their own athletic performance that if you can, in the, you know what it's like when you go down the climbing gym, there's some days you just can't miss. Sure. I mean, you are just, you're crushing it. You're not any stronger, but you, you're on it. And there are other days where it feels like you're wearing a weight belt. Well, you haven't changed physically, so something's changed. And if we could access that uh, as as a climbing community, then we could see standards push much higher, I think. Have you ever had to confront things like that in your own pursuits? Like for yourself, it seems like a lot of your time is has been spent in, in Chamonix with, with mountaineering, and it sounds like, I'm not sure where, but a couple first descents and, and a lot of time just kind of exploring that region. Um, I am the opposite of a mountaineer. If it doesn't have air conditioning, toilets, <laughs> it's not climbing. Uh, I'm an indoor guy. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, all these topics that you've reflected on in the last couple of years, uh, do you find yourself trying to internalize some of that for, for your own climbing? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose my climbing's changed a bit now sure. um, for a variety of uh, reasons, personal family things, and just getting old. <laughs> you don't have the same appetite for risk and adventure, I would say. But um, I think definitely looking back now on my my alpine climbing career, and the reality is it probably is behind me. I will do some, but nothing like um, the volume I used to do and the level I used to do. I mean, it wasn't a particularly high level, but I climbed some classic thousand meter north faces in the Alps and did some reasonably big scary routes on big scary peaks by by my standards, not by world standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think looking back now, especially having talked to a lot of psychologists, I definitely hit my psychological limit hmm. um, and definitely hit a stage where I was doing it because I wanted to be the guy who'd done it rather than I didn't actually want to be there. Wow, uh, but it maybe just didn't, maybe just didn't have the maturity or whatever to to realize that. But um, about, really, can, can I can I ask about yeah, how old you were when you felt like you when you reached that stage? Um, I think with hindsight, like almost as soon as I started track climbing, wow. I didn't have a very good head for it. But I, I mean, I really persevered, and I got to I got to an okay level. Um, mm -hmm. I did a lot, done I don't know four or five hundred routes in the Alps. Um, I did a lot of Scottish winter climbing, a uh, reasonable amount of ice climbing. Like I, I, I didn't just, I wasn't terrible, but I never had that um, thing that really good drag climbers with have of just go for it. I was mm -hmm. always the guy who'd shuffle back down and try and fiddle a, a crap piece of protection in uh, or like fudge and take 10 minutes fudging an ice screw into mm -hmm ice it was like sugar even though it wouldn't have held me if it fallen off instead yeah. of pushing on. i never had that kind of just go for it and occasionally like you have you have moments where you manage to kind of get through it but i think yeah with hindsight I, I probably wasn't i was doing things i wasn't really bold enough to do because i wanted to be bold enough to do them uh, but if i mean mm. if i went back and have my time again i probably wouldn't do them which would be a shame because i managed to survive them and i'm really <laughs> glad i did them uh, so it's all worked out in the end. But yeah, I mean, I guess if I would talk to, talk to me as a 27, I, I must have been like mid, mid to late 20s. I would say, you don't need to do this. <laughs> if, you don't want to, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, by, but by the same token, they're some of the, the best memories I've got and I wouldn't swap them for anything. But even now, I do like doing things that get me a little bit scared. But it's definitely at a different level. But I mean, uh, 
yeah I, I, I mean it did a big two day ski traverse at the end of March and there was a lot of that that was serious mm-hmm. um, I don't want to be too dramatic but there was a lot of it where if you fall over you're going to die right and it's and you really need to be concentrating and you need to a bit like Tom Brady you need to really be on your game at the key moment to make sure you don't fall over and I still I still got a buzz out of that um, but it's definitely it's definitely at a different level hmm so we've already spoken that you spent a lot of time in Chamonix after school mm-hmm. uh, guiding, and you actually ended up writing a, a guidebook or, or being uh, one of the guys putting together kind of a, a greatest hits guidebook from my understanding of it. It seems like there was so much going on over there that there was a market for let's put together the best of the best and create this kind of uh, um, uh, comprehensive guidebook for people. Um, but your time in Chamonix... Uh, seems to have led to your time with Epic TV. And I'm curious how that relationship started and how... Um, I, I don't know when you started with Epic TV. What uh, what year was that? So so what happened was I moved to Chamonix. I mentioned earlier, finished university, got this job, work at an outdoor center, got the opportunity to do some trek leading in Chamonix. Mm-hmm. Did three summers of that and I got to Chamonix and I was my mum was a, an armchair mountain here so I'd read loads of literature. And I remember right. getting to Chamonix and I just thought, I can't believe I'm in Chamonix. Yeah. I, was, I was physically shaking at being <laughs> there. It was it was it was like a pilgrimage to Mecca without wanting to overdo it. Yeah, you know, I just couldn't believe it. And I got there and I did that first summer. And I just thought, well, this is it. This is what I want to do. Uh, and I stayed, never left. Um, and over time, thought, well, I'll become a mountain guide, um, a professional, get my full IFMGA, which is highest. Uh, level of qualification i'll get get my iphone ga badge and i'll be a mountain guide who lives in chamonix and that's that's me that's how my life's going to be and uh once i've done a few summers trekking around the alps i then got the opportunity to um lead trips further afield so i spent about three or four years being an expedition leader um based out of chamonix but then spending large chunks of the year in the himalayas the andes and um the uh, africa and um, everything was going great. Just thought, yeah, this is me. Uh, this is the guiding life. And I just got more and more destroyed physically. It's just it's a hard workload. Sure. And I just I just thought, right, I need I, I need to do something else. Kind of had a realization that I physically wasn't going to take it. Um, and it just came along at the right time. Epic TV had been going a couple of years, and Jack Geldard, who I mentioned earlier, um, who I owe a lot to. Um, was presenting for Epic TV and he had lots of other stuff on and he just said, look, I, I haven't got time for this. You should try out. And I'd literally never done anything like that before. I'd always been quite a confident public speaker. Right. Uh, I don't, uh, not only on the live stream, but I, I don't mind getting up in front of hundreds of people and speaking. It's never mm-hmm. bothered me. Uh, but I'd never seen a camera. I'd never seen a microphone. I, I literally had no idea. And I thought, okay, yeah, go along. And uh, had a had a tryout with Hugo from Epic TV, who's now one of climbing's biggest celebrities in his own right. <laughs> um, and it was just, oh man, I remember he said to me, "Just do a sound check." I said, "Oh, what's what sort of sound check?" And he went, "You know, just what you normally do." And I just said, "I I don't know how to do a sound check." <laughs> so, <laughs> I really, you know, I really had no idea. You couldn't pick anything out of like Hollywood movie tropes or anything. No, just it, completely blanked. Man, when that camera's looking at you, you just go blank. It's like your mind sure. just empties. Yeah, and uh, I just, I just thought, okay. But he'd asked me to prepare something to talk about, uh, and I, I talked about it, and and it sounds like I'm being falsely modest, um, a modest man with much to be modest about, but. Um, <laughs> I, I really think there was only me and one other guy who went for it, and I know who the other guy was, mm-hmm. and um, he's not someone you would you would put on a camera. Okay. Uh, and I was someone you wouldn't put on a camera, but just slightly less. <laughs> uh, and it just came along at the perfect time. And the first week, uh, they said, right, well, we, we were going to send Jack, but now you're here, and we're going to Uli Steck's house. And we've got to ask him about um, what happened on Annapurna. It's quite controversial because some people think he didn't do it. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking, oh my god, this is this is. I thought I was just going to sit in the Epic TV office, sort of say hi, welcome to the show, and do some voiceovers. And mm-hmm. suddenly we're off to really Steck's house, and I've got to ask him all these questions about 
about Annapurna and the Sherpa incident on Everest yeah. a few years before. So it was quite a baptism of fire. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it, it just it just seemed to go well from that that first day. And I mean, obviously, looking back now, you, I could say, oh, I should have done this, or mm-hmm. that's how I should have asked this question, or I wish I moved my hands like this, or I wish I looked here when he was answering. You, know, you can think of all this technical stuff, but um, I kind of quickly realized that I wasn't phased by being filmed which is really important um and it's maybe not something you can fake and i just remember going through lee's house totally totally filling my trousers at the prospect of what we're about to do and it 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 seemed to go pretty well and uh yeah epic tv went from there so it was there for two years we filmed 400 climbing dailies and that that then led to the ifsc so Climbing Daily, before we just talk about the IFSC stuff, did you join at the time where they were still kind of a multi-sport uh, thing or yeah, were you yeah. during so, the climbing phase? No, the climbing phase is relatively recent. Even when I left, it was still multi-sport. Okay. Um, so they, so I joined in October 13. Okay. And I left in the summer of 15. Right. So I was there pretty much two years. Uh, the, yeah, the, I, I think I probably joined just after the kind of heyday of epic tv when not the heyday they came in with a big budget yes to be honest and they threw it at a lot of people and i mm. was probably on the the kind of the just after that amount of money started to decrease right uh, but it was they were still throwing a pretty pretty sizable amounts of money at pretty sizable amounts of people um so yeah it was very much multi-sport they had a big office that while i was there they opened the big warehouse right and then started selling everything. I mean, I've never seen so much outdoor equipment, and I've been in a few outdoor shops. It was, ep- it was, yeah. To write, use the right word, it was epic what they were doing. Did but, you get? Uh, did you get to kind of witness their their decision making and the the process that they went through to that transition? Because that that's such like a fascinating change in their model. Um, it's always interested me. I'll probably have to interview one of them at some point. Yeah, uh, but that's you such sure a. I mean? I used to be in what they call the all hands meetings. Sure. Sometimes, um, but I mean, even when I was, wo- I, we were producing five climbing dailies a week. I was only working two days a week, and I very much had my own role. Right. And I was not involved in any management. I would say, hey, we'd like to go to this event. This is the budget. And certainly, when I first started, they just said yes to everything, which was nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it became a bit tighter as as, as obviously the funding decreased. I don't know much about the decision making, to be honest. I was there when it was happening and I was informed of the decisions and I would sometimes ask people about the decisions, but I wouldn't claim to have any idea why they were being made. Right. So you were around while while they were still in a multi-sport kind of situation and you were holding Mm -hmm. down the climbing side of things for the most part. Yeah, the climbing daily side. I mean, they they had, honestly, they had so many staff. So there's content coming in all the time. So, uh, 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 which uh, I hadn't, including climbing stuff, which I didn't see. So I wasn't involved in any sort of procurement of content. Sure. Uh, beyond climbing daily, as long as I filled five shows a week, right? I was I was good. Um, but they had lots of people bringing content in, and um, it, I offered to say I offered to um, to look at, at content and say if it was any good and whether we should buy it. But they, I was never asked to do that, so. Mm-hmm. I just left them to it. So yeah, I, I, I can't offer much insight. Into well, a, a bit of a cheeky question, but after you left, they did kind of narrow their focus to a climbing specific kind of thing. How much credit do you take personally as somebody that kind of took the climbing daily thing and saw a lot of growth during your time there? And of course it's grown even more beyond that as it's existed for, I guess, what, the the four years? Actually, yeah, four years since then almost. Um, do you feel like any any uh you were part of any like structural development of how climbing daily works do you still see your own touches in what it's become and of course matt's a very different presenter and Mm -hmm. hugo is playing a slightly different role you're seeing him in front of the camera uh now um but uh but were you part of kind of that logical progression from where it was to where it is now i would uh, say i was involved in the evolution of climbing daily for sure i mean nothing against jack because he was a busy guy and he had mm-hmm. other things to do but when i took over the show it was literally jack saying hi welcome here's two cool things see you tomorrow sure um and then when i went we 
Hugo was looking for someone enth- enthusiastic who wanted to be there and who wanted to take it to the next level. So it was he wanted somebody to come in and kind of do what I did, um, and and be more involved. Um, but I, I, was, I couldn't claim any credit for the evolution of Epic TV, um, <laughs> okay. because when I left, they were still going full steam ahead with the skiing, and 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 a few other things. They were very. I mean, they were they were focusing more on climbing, uh, and they just. Um, bought banana fingers mm-hmm. the, the shot um but i mean i i it would be a stretch to say my i had any any influence in the changing of epic tv i think they just realized that climbing was where it was at um if that was down to the success of climbing daily then maybe but no i i don't think i had any role in the evolution of epic but i certainly feel like i took climbing daily to something new it became a show where uh, we went places and talked to people and um interacted with the climbing community rather than just observe it but i mean what matt but but, but again i was working two days a week and mm-hmm. um, so we'd film three a day um and that was how it went and hugo would have liked me to have been full time but I had, I had other stuff on uh and i would i didn't i didn't want it to be full time i didn't have any i didn't have a family i didn't have anyone to pay for i didn't need much money um so it's re- i mean what matt's done with it is amazing Matt's Matt's been the guy who's taken it from the little thing it was uh, with me and Jack to to what it is now. So Matt and Hugo uh, deserve the credit, but I, I would, if I was to give myself any credit, I would say I at least kind of got it moving. But that would be about as far as I'd go. So that ended with your transition to uh, taking the role at the IFSC. And I think that was, I guess you kind of are the successor to, I think Adrian Battersby was the guy directly before you, if I remember right. How did that transition go? Not not with Adrian or the IFSC, but how did your transition from Epic TV to being an IFSC presenter go? So when I, when I left Epic TV, um, again, it's a bit of a recurring theme. It's like when I left uh, university, I didn't really have a plan. Sure. Um, but uh, we moved to Innsbruck uh, and I just thought I just I'll do something else. I, I felt I'd taken climbing daily as far as I could. Now Matt has proved that I was completely well. <laughs> we've probably taken it as far as I could. Okay. Matt Matt has proved that the, the the show itself could be taken a lot further. But I didn't feel like I had the um, the skill or the or the energy really to take it to what he's done. Uh, so I I felt that I'd done everything I could with it, and. Um, Obviously, I was thinking, well, what, what can I do now? I really like this broadcasting thing, but I'm also writing. And I was I was still writing a bit on the side, so I had a bit of ink. I had enough income to live. And obviously, one of the things I'd done with Climbing Daily was go to IFSC events. And I thought, well, I kind of feel like I could contribute to what they what they do. And they had uh, Johnny Baker as well commentating back then, as well sure. as Adrian. Um, and I wasn't necessarily looking to be the commentator. I didn't know. I knew the Olympic decision was looming. It hadn't been announced then, but like well, it was, it was an open secret, wasn't it? Everyone knew mm-hmm. it was going to happen, and um, I felt I could contribute. I didn't know in what role. I thought maybe I'll make a podcast for them. Maybe I'll go along as a presenter or kind of a pit lane reporter. You know, like a pitch side reporter. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, and I just thought I get in touch. And um, as with all these things, it kind of took a lot of pushing you get an email back oh that sounds interesting yeah thanks Mm -hmm. okay well uh, maybe we could meet up and so it took a lot of work on my part not a lot of work a lot of emailing and a lot of hassling and a lot of calling hey it's me the guy from epic tv uh just wondering if you'd consider the email i sent you you know Mm -hmm. hustling hustling yeah and uh eventually i got a meeting with Anne Finel, who's the head of communications one of the more prominent members of the ifsc management uh, in Annecy, and it, it's a good example actually for anyone self-employed. <laughs> I'm a good example for anyone. <laughs> so. uh, I live in Innsbruck. It's seven hours to Annecy, and Anne said, "Well, can you come? Up, can you meet in Annecy tomorrow?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, no problem." Sure. So just drive to Annecy because I really wanted to make something happen, uh, and it's, it's it seemed to go pretty well. Uh, and she said, "Yeah, we definitely got a role for you." And it, and it kind of over time became obvious that they wanted me to to commentate and present. Um, and I have to say, Johnny Baker, big props to Johnny Baker, yeah. sent me an email and said, you've got a great job there and no hard feelings. And 
why don't we talk on Skype? And I called him on Skype and he said, you know what, I would love to have carried on, but it's clear they've found you and they like you more, uh, but really wish you the best of luck. And that was, yeah, I really have a lot of respect for that because hmm. it's a heart when somebody, when in that situation, it's awkward for everyone. Sure. Um, but they were moving on from the production company. They got a new production company and I think they just wanted a whole fresh start. I don't think there was, it was any reflection of how Johnny was doing the job. They just wanted the whole thing to be different, mm -hmm. um, and sadly for Johnny, he was, he was probably just a casualty of that. That they just wanted a fresh start, um, but he was really, really good about it, and I, I got to give him a big shout out for that. And um, yeah, it just became obvious that they wanted me full time, and they wanted a long term commitment, um, and I was happy to do it. And Yes, suddenly we just bowled up in my ring and in 2016, I just remember thinking, oh my God, what have I, wow, wow. I was just, I was just completely overwhelmed by it. But um, yeah, it was a tough first year, but uh, began to find my feet after that. The first year that you did it, did they still have uh, the live chat going on? Like, I, I guess the, the question I'm leading to is, how did you cope with the feedback of the internet. You're a new guy, you're a new voice that people aren't used to. No matter how good of a job you do, there's gonna be criticism just because you're different. Um, and I, if I remember right, there was actually a lot of excellent, like uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm about you as well when you switched over. But there was also just that, you know, there's been a change and now people are gonna complain. How did that go uh, for yourself? Um, you're definitely aware of that. Mm -hmm. I don't make a I don't make a point of reading feedback. If you lived your life by what people say about you online, your life would be a pretty miserable place. That <laughs> sure. is not a way. I, um, but you can't. I, obviously, I'm aware of what people are saying, and mm -hmm. sometimes people would text me, friends of mine, saying, "Oh my God, just just ignore what you're reading online." I was thinking, I haven't read anything online. Yeah. But then, obviously, you would have to read it and think, "Oh no." Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, the reality is I was much greener than I thought. Right. Um, to be, to, to, to really be honest. Um, well, this was, this was this your first time presenting uh, live consistently? Yeah, it's the first, first time audio commentating other right. than dabble, dabbling at university. Sure. Uh, just messing about a little bit on whatever, I mean, we can't have been live streaming then. Probably no. on VCR, I don't know, whatever it was. <laughs> I did some, I did some really basic sort of speaking about rugby over mm -hmm. a match or something, I can't remember. Um, I, I, I massively underestimated how green I was, but then by the same token, if I could go back and have my time again, how do you prepare for it? Because sure. you can't simulate it. I sat here, I took Johnny Baker's advice, which is uh, Johnny Baker, Johnny Bryan. Um, I think I called it Johnny Baker earlier on. Um, you did, but I also don't remember this name. No, it's Johnny Bryan. I don't know. I don't know anyone called Johnny. Maybe he's an English TV presenter. Really sorry, sorry Johnny. He couldn't have been nicer. Uh, and still is whenever I encounter him. I just forgot his surname. Um, I, I, I took his advice and um, and watched IFSC streams and talked over them and mm -hmm. listened to it back and thought, oh, that sounds okay, that could be better. But nothing compares to when you get there. I mean, we did. We also we did a test event the week before Myring and I went to the French National Youth Championship or something. Sure which wasn't that useful because I didn't know who anyone was. So I couldn't yeah. say any of the names. So, but anyway. Um, it's pretty close nothing, to what a typical World Cup is, though, as well. Just yeah, a lot exactly, of names, yeah. yeah. Who's this Russian guy? Um, yeah. Nothing can really prepare you for the director coming in your ear and going, okay, one minute's alive. Mm -hmm. And you just think, wow, if I fluff my opening line here, it's fluffed, it's gone. When I was filming with Hugo, even if we're filming an interview with Uli Steck, I could say something and they go, oh, sorry, that was that was crap. Forget, sorry, Uli, just hang on. Let's do that again. You can't do that. It's live. And uh, although I realize now kind of how green I was, I'm not really sure what you can do about it. Um, I got hired. I hadn't done any live streaming before. <laughs> There's got to be a first time. Um, but it was, yeah, it was massively stressful. And uh, looking back, when I, I basically don't really watch any of those 2016 streams now because it, I find it quite awkward to watch. Um, sure. Because I would say I would say 2018, so last year, was the first season where I really thought I know how to do this job. I can't 
do it perfectly every time and I make mistakes, but I know in theory how to do this. I know I know the theory of what I should be doing now and I might get it wrong at times, but I I at least understand in theory how one does this job. Um because it just takes a long time. And I I really studied before I started admiring him, but um, more so once I'd begun to understand my limitations and what skills I was missing. I really study it. I'm almost scientific about it. I watch the streams back. I make notes. I try and notice any phrases I'm repeating and not repeat them in the future. I watch how other people do it and make notes. When I see someone interviewing someone on TV, I watch how they stand, what they do with their hands, how they hold the microphone, when they look at the camera, when they look at the interviewee. I really, like, I really study it. Uh, and that's, I think, over time, it feels to me like that is uh, paying off and I'm becoming uh, more and more comfortable of it, of it. So with it. So um, although I could kind of beat myself up, I think with hindsight, it just it just takes a while to get your head around that stuff. I'm going to I feel like at some point we're going to we're going to do a second part to this interview where we just talk about how we feel about climbing and, and broadcasting for climbing. But I want to kind of wrap up this this part one, I guess we'll call it. Um, and that is to bring up the fact that uh, a lot of these things that we've talked about are still going for you. You are on the road constantly for, what is it, about eight months of the year or seven months of the year with the IFSC mm -hmm. from, I guess, April through November, typically. Um, and that's crisscrossing the world. And I imagine that would be incredibly tiring. Um, on top of that, you're fitting in this podcast when you can. You have another job, which if you want to speak about, feel free, although that's kind of a separate part of your life. And then of course you have a personal uh, and family life. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever imagine when you were younger that you were going to have all of these things going on at once? Because this sounds like too much for me, frankly. Well, right? I mean, the first thing I should say is my other job is working for a mapping company, an outdoor mapping company. Mm -hmm. I'm not in Steel Team 6 or anything. Sadly. Sure. <laughs> it, sound, it sounded cool when you That would be incredible. That. Yeah, but I have to admit, it's just, uh, it's probably not that interesting. Um, to be honest, I had no idea what I was going to do or how I was going to do it. Uh, but I got to say, life doesn't feel that full. I want more. Like, I feel like there's space for a lot more. Um, if you think we have IFSC events, so we've got Munich next weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, we I came back from China after delays. I came back uh, a week ago. A week's kind of a long time. You, you can you can do a lot and we don't have to go to Munich until Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So right in the middle of, of theoretically the busy season, I've got nine days there. So I, I don't feel like my life's life's too full. I feel like it's it's a pretty, pretty good balance. I could I could definitely deal with more and would kind of welcome hmm. uh, financially. I would welcome uh, <laughs> more work, obviously. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, life life doesn't feel too full. I feel like I've got lo lots of uh, relaxing time. And lots of sport watching time and lots of lots of time to do the stuff I like doing, but the traveling, the traveling can be tiring, but it's a pretty first world problem, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I if I think or it, this year that I've been to uh, ski touring in Norway and we had the snowfall in Meiringen and filmed in Red Square and I've been to three cities in China and. Go to America. Go to Canada at the end of the month, and America after that. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't complain. That's all I'm saying. I, I got no complaints. So um, yeah, life's pretty good. Cool. I think that's a really good place to end with uh, part number one. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank you for. I guess it's the evening at this point uh, where you are, and it's still still. I normally wouldn't have woken up yet if it's by my time here in Toronto. Uh, we will do a part two. We'll figure out when we can do that. Uh, but for now, I really appreciate you spending this time in the middle of a, of a day and kind of your, your, your inter-competition time. So thanks very much for kind of talking about how you got to where you are and, and how you think about these things. And it's definitely going to help me put together a set of questions as we talk about 
climbing's current state. Um, I think your perspective is really interesting, and this has been helpful to kind of flesh out my picture of yourself as somebody that's a really important voice um, and also just an influencer for the sport. Yeah, so. I mean, I've got a lot to say about climbing and climbing broadcasting, so we, we should definitely do part two. Absolutely, but, yeah. But but you do a, you do a great job. I watch all the debriefs. I'm halfway through Wujang right now. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, and you do you you and John do a a really good job. Thank you. Yeah, and it, we'll... is, it is John, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember him by his Instagram name because that's always what appears at the bottom. Oh yeah, JB climbs. I think yeah, is his exactly. Instagram. Suddenly yeah, we had this yeah. panic that I got another name wrong. Yeah, no, it's all good. Well, no, yeah. Anyway, no, but well, um, but no, you, you do a great job. And, thanks. Uh, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to talk about. And I'm aware that I've my life has kind of been slightly bohemian. I hope people could follow this weird. Um, this weird story that kind of kept jumping back and forth to well, I think uh, for, New Zealand and the Alps. And for, for those of us it, that have... felt a bit all over the place. For those of us that are still in the climbing industry past your mid-20s, there's a good chance that that kind of story is 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 likely your you, you know your your origin story if you're still in it. Because again, there's not much reward in terms of money for most of us that stay no, in climbing. No, exactly. So. Everyone's, anyone that's managed to carve out a living in the climbing world has mm -hmm. probably had a pretty circuitous route to get that. I met a guy, by sure. the way, quickly i met a guy guiding around the everest circuit and I, I kind of asked him his life story he got lots of time and he said yeah so for a while i was the biggest lsd producer in britain <laughs> um, and i got caught and i was inside for eight years mm -hmm. and i kind of had a bit of a rethink and i was thinking wow god i, I think i've led a bit of an all over the place life That's yeah so yeah i think i think it's inevitable i hope people watching could kind of vaguely follow <laughs> what i was on about yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and again, we'll talk more. So anyway, thank you very much for, for taking the time, Charlie. And thanks to you for watching. Uh, stick around for part two, which will air at some point. I don't even know where this will. Just for the record, this was recorded on March or sorry, May, what, 14th? Yeah, just the, ahead of the Munich is, is just the weekend before just, Munich. just before Munich. So I don't know when this will air. I'll probably wait until part two is recorded before I air these. But anyway, if you enjoyed this, uh, leave a like and of course, subscribe so you know when the next interview is coming out. Um, and thanks very much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.